Welcome to Chatterbox Bearcats, everyone. Chuck Walter with you. This is your home for live Cincinnati Bearcats coverage after every single game, except this one. We didn't go live. This is the taped version as I got stuck in an Outback Steakhouse for my father-in-law's birthday, ate a few too many blooming onions, was watching the game on my phone, and just could not make it back in time for the final buzzer. So I said, we're nixing it tonight. We're Lance nixing it. And instead, we're just going to tape this, get our thoughts together, and talk some Bearcats as they defeat the Stetson Hatters 83-75. to First of all, Cincinnati, according to the stat sheet, played well. They shot it 51% from the floor. They dominated the boards once again, 40-24, to the final tally in that regard. So how the hell was this a game? Because the eight-point Cincinnati win, that doesn't really tell the entire story. This one was closer than it appeared. And the answer is Cincinnati's defense stinks at this point. I mean, it it, it stinks. Mick Cronin would be throwing a fit right now if he was coaching this team because they have talent defensively. They have quickness. They have length. They have an elite on the ball defender, at least according to Wes Miller, and he's looked good uh, most of the time this year, and John Newman. And then you got massive guys down low in every regard, you know? Uh, sure, they did not have Aziz Bandego today. The Bearcats also did not have Simas Lukosius. Uh, Lukosius dealing with a shoulder injury um, due to being hit by that car. Had an MRI on the shoulder. Should be good to go come New Year and could be good to go next Friday against Evansville. They didn't need him tonight, but as I mentioned, it did get close. This team is elite at rebounding. We We know that that is an identity that they have right now, but you can't just be an elite rebounding team. Like Houston, so great on the glass, but they also defended. They could knock down shots. They could get to the rim. Like Houston was good at everything. They just happened to be a great rebounding team too that was really physical. Cincinnati's not really physical defensively. Uh, They're a great offensive rebounding team. They've out-rebounded every team thus far this season and and typically in convincing fashion. We'll see if that continues once the um, front lines get a little bit bigger in the Big 12. I thought this team could get out and run, force some turnovers, finish in transition. On paper, it seems like they have good transition players, right? Athletes, um, point guards that can run, bigs that can finish the oop. That's not been the case. This team doesn't force turnovers, and quite frankly, when they have ran this year, it's been sloppy basketball. They try to make one extra pass, goes out of bounds or it's knocked away or they don't make the extra pass and um, I will say this ADD kicking in there haven't been many Bearcat offensive fouls this year I've noticed that so take it for what it's worth Um, you see the offensive foul all the time in transition but I'm trying to like think to myself how many offensive fouls have there been not many defensively they're fouling a ton Stetson shot 29 free throws in the game If I'm not mistaken, yes, 24 points on 29 free throws. 24, they're 75 points. That's about a third of their points came on free throws. You remember mixed teams back in the day? They had the bigs down low to where teams would drive in the lane, and it just always seemed like other teams would miss layups. They'd, They'd carve through, you know, they'd penetrate, they'd get good looks, but for whatever reason, they just could not finish. And the more and more I watched it, the more and more I realized it was because Cincinnati just had bigs down low that were so long and so good defensively that they would affect shots even if they weren't blocking it. And teams would miss layups. Cincinnati would get rebounds. Um, You know, there'd be a lot of physical action down low. Fouls would never be called. You'd wonder, hey, Cincinnati's getting a good whistle. No, they were just good defenders. This team doesn't have good defenders. They're fouling left and right. Wes has got to coach these guys up defensively because I told you a couple of weeks ago, I thought that this team's identity could be defense with um, the talent that they have, and that has not been the case at all. Uh, Wes, let's see what you got. Time to coach them up because they haven't looked good defensively. Dan Skillings hadn't looked good in a while. Oh, baby. Was he good today? Damn, Daniel. Back at it again. Back at it again in the White Jordans. Five of his first six games, he shot 10-plus. 10 10-plus 10 field goals. 
He hadn't since. Last four or five games, he had only shot six, seven field goals. Kind of, you know, quiet. Disappeared a little bit. Today, he was an alpha. Uh, He put up 14 shots. He hit 11 of them. Put up six threes, hit four of them. If Dan Skillings is hitting four of six from three-point range, all of a sudden, this team becomes very dangerous. But then at the same time, Dan Skilling goes off for a career-high 29 points, 10 rebounds, yet somehow Cincinnati barely wins this game. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Wes Miller said after the game about Dan Skilling's, quote, we need some guys to emerge. We all know Dan's capable of it. I think talent-wise, Dan's as talented as anyone on this team. Is he ready to be that guy day in and day out? I thought after the NKU game, yes. I thought he was the best player on the team. It was between him and Lockin. But when you disappear for four or five games, two of them being the biggest games in the non-conference, and I mean completely disappear. He was a no-show against Xavier and Dayton. When that happens, you wonder. But this is a step in the right direction. He looked excellent. Was flying everywhere. And and you're going to get that regardless of how he plays offensively. You're going to get someone that crashes the glass and seems like a pretty elite rebounder right now had a double double 29 points 10 rebounds is consistently grabbing double figure rebounds so Dan Skillings uh, the Cats in order to be a great team they need a great player they need someone to step up and be the alpha because this committee thing it hasn't been working because unfortunately no one's on at the same time you know it's it's two guys one game and you don't get any CJ, you don't get any CMOS, you don't get any Day-Day. You have to have multiple guys step up at the same time. Or, if you don't have multiple guys step up at the same time, which isn't happening right now, you have to have someone that you can rely on every single game. And I know Lockin's numbers say that he's that guy, and maybe he is. But I just, give me someone at the guard position, too, that can do it every single game. 29 points. Uh, Most by a Bearcat off the bench since 2010. Sean Kilpatrick scored 26 in a game against Wright State back in 2010. I forgot Killa was coming off the bench. Ibrahima Thomas actually had the uh, starting spot that year in Kilpatrick's redshirt freshman year. And that's now three straight poor offensive showings for Newman. I thought he'd been as steady as anyone through the first nine games, but not good at all the last couple. It's time to play your best players, whomever that may be. I don't know. But someone step up and take someone else's minutes, please. I don't need eight guys at 20 minutes a game. We don't need it right now. John Newman. Will the real John Newman please stand up? Dan Skillings. You want to step up and steal that spot? Go for it. Center position. Someone go for Vic's job. There's two of them now. It's Aziz when he's back. Injured today, but it's not, you know, anything too serious. It's an injury he suffered in the Dayton game. You also have Jameel Reynolds. And Jameel Reynolds had a nice game. I think if this team's going to be really good, someone has to come for Victor Lockin's job. And that doesn't mean Vic is bad. And that doesn't mean Vic isn't going to get a lot of minutes and have his moments in the Big 12. I just think someone needs to be better defensively. Someone needs to steal his job. And it's not going to be Aziz Bandago, unfortunately. I think he's going to be good. I think he's going to have his moments against certain teams where he really helps you win some games. But consistently, defensively, I think the best chance you have is throwing Jameel Reynolds down there. Big body, physical, grabs rebounds, can guard, you know, traditional post bigs, which a lot of Big 12 teams have. Now, can he guard those bigs when they get out to the perimeter? A Hunter Dickinson type? I don't know. But that's why you have three different bigs right now, if you're Wes Miller, that all do things a little bit differently, stylistically, uh, a bit different. But Reynolds was awesome. He had 14 points and four rebounds in this one. Lockin was good, too. 12 points, nine rebounds. Let's just run through the box score. Day-Day Thomas had 17 points and four rebounds. John Newman, as I mentioned, struggled. Two points, three assists, did grab eight boards. C.J. Frederick had six points and seven assists. Nice, C.J. Odie didn't score. Skillings had the 29 and 10. 
Jizzle James had three points and three assists in the limited minutes, and Josh Reed did not score in his nine minutes. Cincinnati's 10-2. and two. They can't hide anymore. Schedule picks up starting today. And I know what you're thinking. They got Evansville up next. Evansville's good. Evansville's better than every non-conference team that they've played not named Xavier or Dayton. Evansville can give you some fits. This time of the year, crowds aren't as big. Students are on vacation. Looking ahead to BYU. It'll be after a long week off. That's a dangerous game against Evansville. I don't care how you win it. If the score is 83-75, so be it. Just go out there and win the game. Take care of business against Evansville because Cincinnati can't hide after that. There's going to be a verdict on Wes Miller here soon. The perception's going to change because right now, and I'm kind of in this boat too, there are a bunch of people that are right down the middle on Wes Miller that believe in him but haven't seen anything to believe in him. You know what I'm saying? Like, Here's how I feel about Wes Miller. In terms of bringing the Jordan unis back and recruiting and players loving him and his demeanor and um, him, you know, chewing 900 packs of gum on the sidelines and barking at the refs and really picking up where Mick and Huggy Bear left off in that realm. Like, he gets an A+. Plus. He get, We want this guy to succeed. Seems like Bearcat fans are, you know, Letting a lot of these losses fly because of the recruiting, because of all these things that he has done that has nothing to do with wins and losses. But if we're talking strictly wins and losses, it's a D. He's got a D on the report card. His only big win was over Illinois in his first big game. He won it. He's lost every single big one since. His other quad one win, a road win against UCF, a UCF team that wasn't even good. But there's no hiding anymore. We're going to know a lot more about this team. As of right now, they're 10-2. and two. Record looks good. Um, net ranking, or, or Ken Palm, I should say, looks good. There are two losses, one to Dayton, who I think is a good team on a neutral floor. The other one, the Xavier Musketeers, you never beat Xavier. So you won all the games you were supposed to win, except Dayton. I would say they... they we're probably supposed to be Dayton, considering they were a uh, five-and-a-half-point favorite. But you enter Big 12 play, and I think a lot of people don't know what to expect. Some out there are saying this is the worst team in the Big 12, and Bearcat faithful, you know, that love the Cats. They're like, I've seen enough against Merrimack, Stetson, and Dayton the, the last three games to wave the white flag. They're going to get destroyed in the Big 12. I've also heard some people say they're going to figure it out. They're going to be pretty solid. This team can flirt with an NCAA tournament. Going to be no hiding. You know? Last year in the American, it took 10, 15 games um, before it was like, all right, th- this team just doesn't have it. You know, they, they won some games. They, they got back into the, the uh, next 16 out or whatever to where they were at least – a few wins away. Hey, you beat this Houston team. Maybe you pop back onto the bubble. It, it took a while to kind of, you know, fully put the nail in the coffin. This year's team, it's going to take like two weeks into the new year. I mentioned the schedule on the last show. It's at BYU. It's Texas. It's at Baylor. It's TCU. It's Oklahoma. It's at Kansas. You lose all six of those games in convincing fashion. Knock on wood. Wes Miller's seat's going to get a little hot. And you're saying, Chuck, it's third season. Look, first season was a complete wash. He brought in guys like A.J. McGinnis, Jared Hensley. He clearly was just feeling out, you know, what kind of players it really took to, to win at this level. And quite frankly, he was brought in late. And he did what he could with what he had. Let's say that. Year two, he struck out on some transfers. Kalua Zipke was supposed to play a role. He didn't. Rob Fennessy was supposed to play a role. He got hurt. Granted, I don't know how much of a role he would have played had he been healthy all season. John Newman, supposed to play a big role. He was hurt. So, kind of a wash there. And and they got better. They got better. So, year two, in that regard, whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll call it somewhat of a success. Year three... 
There's no more excuses anymore. If this team stinks, it's one of two things. It's talent or it's coaching, or it could be a mixture of both. Do you think this team has the talent? I don't know. I look up and down the roster. I think they're pretty solid. I think they have some ball players. Got to coach them up. Got to coach them up. Comes down to coaching, and we saw Sean Miller run a clinic around him. We've seen the last two mid-major coaches, I think, you know, put on a pretty good game plan to stay in the game against a much more talented team and a team that out-rebounded them by each game. Merrimack and Stetson, they lost by like 15 to 20 on the boards. Cincinnati had so much more physical talent. Wasn't even close. And Cincinnati's hanging around right now. Now, if Cincinnati comes out and wins at BYU and takes down Texas, there's no, you know, hot seat talk. It changes that quickly. That's what I mean by the perception will change one way or the other very quick, and there's no hiding. You haven't won any big games, and you have a ton of them coming up, and you're going to prove it one way or the other. There is no hiding what this team is. We will see. Uh, Clearly, clearly, they need to work on finding an identity aside from just being a great rebounding team, which they are. So we will see. No flow right now. So many subs. Who's your best players? Who are your five best players? Give them 30 minutes. Start playing your best players. Give the other players 8 to 12, 12 to 15. Enough of this eight guys get 20 minutes. This is not the 2015 Kentucky Wildcats. There's no platooning with this team. There's going to be five best players. There's going to be five players that are better than the rest by the season's end. Um, and, And there probably are right now. Let's figure out who those five guys are. Because there's too many bodies running in and out. There's no flow. Let's get some flow. 